Well, this morning we are going to be talking from uh, Philippians chapter 2. And as you see there, the title of the message, It's Not About You. Now, I wasn't looking for a way to start this message. I, I wasn't looking for an opening story. But yesterday something happened and I'm like, that's just too good. So I got to tell you, my dad and I were in New Hampshire. We were speaking at this men's conference and there were like 750, 800 guys at this conference, and it was at a church that held exactly that amount of people. They didn't let anyone into the sanctuary until like 15 minutes before the thing was going to start. So imagine if everyone in this room right now was jammed out into the entryway and kind of flowing out onto the sidewalks. That's the feel that was happening the morning before this event got started yesterday. So everyone, you know, trying to act like everything's all good, but you get a little tense and you get a little like, okay, I got to get out of here. I want to get to the thing I'm trying to go to. So that's kind of the vibe that's going on here. And in the midst of that, I walked into, they converted all the women's restrooms into men's rooms. It's a men's conference. That's the only people there. Walked into the bathroom and I walked in and I, I don't have a better way to tell this story. So there's two people involved in the story. I'm going to call him the older guy and the younger guy, but it's not a slam. You know, it's not bad that he's older. Just that's who he was. So sorry if that bothers you. Uh, so the older guy, I walk in the bathroom and he's got some paper towels and it looks like, you know, just the bathroom's just getting used like crazy. So there was some soap that got spilled on the countertop and there was a bunch of water from people that just kind of dried their hands like this. Ladies, I don't know if that happens in your bathrooms, but in guys' bathrooms, it's, it's kind of a disaster zone if you let that many people in there. So this guy, he's got a bunch of paper towels, and he's wiping off the counter at the sink. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's great. You know, someone's trying to give back or whatever. I don't know. So uh, the problem was, you know how sometimes when you hear people that are mumbling under their breath, you don't know exactly what they're saying, but you know the spirit of what they're saying? So I hear this guy, he's like, oh, are such a sloppy pigs, and he's complaining while he's doing it. So I'm like, okay, you're doing the right thing, wrong reason, bad attitude, but, you know, I'll give you some credit. So this guy, then, he, he walks over, he's going to throw these paper towels in the trash can, and the setup in this bathroom was so weird. So if the sink was here, the door was here, and it opened this way, and on the other side was where the trash can was. So he's walking over to try to put this in the trash, and there's just a stream of people that are coming into this bathroom. And so he, a couple people have walked through, and he's getting really frustrated now. So you know how kids will, like, shut a door and try to hold it closed with their foot so no one can come in? This guy, this old guy, starts doing this. He's, and, and he's mad, all right? And he pinned somebody between the door and the door jam. This guy is just trying to walk into the bathroom. He doesn't know what's going on. And this older guy, he's again muttering under his breath. He's like, I just wish people would just use their brain. And he's, he's so mad. And he's got this guy pinned right here. And I'm watching this thing. I'm like, what is going on? And this younger guy, he looks right at him. And I was like, uh-oh, I'm getting ready for a blow-up to happen here. And he goes, have a great day, sir. And then he just went about his thing. I was like, wow, I would not have said that. That was not what came to my mind, you know. Uh, <laughs> but... I, when I watched it happen, I just thought it's so easy for us to get so wrapped up in what's going on in our own head, in our own lives, that we lose sight of this. It's not about us. And this guy in that moment, even if he was doing the right action and he could have justified everything that he did, He's like, well, they don't understand. I'm trying to get this done. Everyone's blocking me. Everyone's frustrating me. Everyone's slowing me down. Well, if he gets looking at things from other people's perspective, if he gets that there's maybe more going on than what he's immediately seeing, then he's going to start to see it's not about him. It's not about you. It's not about me. So we're going to look this morning at Philippians chapter 2. And you can turn there. It's also going to be up on the screen. And Paul is writing the book of Philippians to a group of people that he knows. He was the one who planted this church in Philippi on his second missionary journey. And when he got there, he found that Philippi, for whatever reason, 
was a real hot spot for ex-Roman soldiers. When they finished their tour of duty or when they were coming home for a little break, this was where they liked to settle down in Philippi. So this place had a really distinctly Roman flavor as opposed to Jewish or Greek or whatever. And so you can see when Paul writes the book of Philippians that he's writing not in the same way with a lot of the um, kind of heady theological words and phrases that he uses in a lot of other the books that he writes where he points back to the Old Testament because he's writing to people who don't really have that foundation. They, their first exposure to what God wanted to do in their lives was through Paul getting the word out about what Jesus had done. And so he doesn't really bring them on a big, long history lesson the way that he ordinarily would, but he makes a lot of personal appeals because, again, these are people that he knows, that he's met for the most part, that he's spent time with, and they watched how he lived out his faith in Jesus. And so he makes a lot of, um, not even arguments, he makes a lot of uh, requests almost from a personal level to this church in Philippi. This is one of his only letters where he doesn't spend very much time critiquing them about something, but he's just writing to encourage them. And so he says in Philippians chapter 2, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. So you see how he's setting this up here. He's saying, if there's been any positive impact in your life from following after Jesus, if the truth of what God wants to do has done anything for you, if it's brought you closer together, if it's brought you more joy, if it's brought you more hope, if there's been anything good that's come about as a result of your journey of following Jesus, he says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And so he moves straight into change behavior, changed action. And these next verses are what we're going to spend the majority of our time on here this morning. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And I want to break down a little bit what he's getting at here uh, in this line that starts, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. What he's doing here, the word he uses for look, it's the word that they would have used to describe someone who's like a sentry or a guardian of their city who sits on the wall or waits at the outskirts of their city and is constantly scanning and scouring the horizon to see if there's potentially any threat headed their way. So this is going to be the first alert system if there's some kind of uh, a natural disaster that they can see, you know, a funnel cloud or something, tornado, that's stuff we'd see around here, or if they see an attacking army because that was sort of the way of the world back then. And Paul's saying... In the same way that if it's somebody's role to constantly be on the lookout for something that might come our way, that might bring us harm, he said, I want you to have that mindset when you're thinking about looking out for other people's interests, which is not a natural thing, right? It's really easy for us to get focused in on what's going on in our lives, why we think the way we do, why we need to do what we need to do, and not really factor other people in. But Paul says we're supposed to be scouting out, looking out, scanning everywhere we can scan to see other people's interests. Now, I want to talk about that word there, uh, interests, because in Greek, what he wrote, he just wrote the word the, so if you read it in Greek, it says each of you should look not only, not only to your own the, because he was writing in a way that they would have understood that he wasn't trying to talk about one thing. He wasn't trying to say, look out 
for other people's interests, look out for other people's strengths or weaknesses or needs or fears or wants or desires. He was saying, just be on the lookout for other people in general. And I don't know, some of you in here might be like me. I really am very good at finding loopholes. And so I could easily read this and go, okay, yeah, well, I I do look out for other people's interests, but I don't know if that's really an interest. seems like that's more of a fear or an insecurity. I think I'm fine. You know, my family, they they won't play the game Scattergories with me anymore um, because I'm so good at these loopholes. You know, the game, you roll the dice, you see what letter everything starts with, and then you get a category. So they don't think I get four points for saying, like, a vintage Volkswagen van, or, or three, I guess that would be. But you guys know, that's right. That's three points. Like, they try to cheat me, but I, I like, <laughs> yeah, I like those loopholes like that. But what Paul's saying here, it's a real loophole closer. He's saying you don't get to justify, you don't get to explain away well, I don't know if that really qualifies as an interest. That seems like something else they're dealing with. He's saying we're supposed to spend our time. We're supposed to spend our energy scanning our environment, being on the lookout all the time for whatever is going on, not only in our own lives, but in other people's lives. Uh, Some of you may know Eugene Peterson. He did, it's not a translation of the Bible, but he did kind of a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. And I love the way he writes it because he tries to put it in everyday language to make it make sense what they were trying to communicate. And he writes this verse this way. He says, don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. And that's the idea that Paul's getting at here. But The thing is, doing that feels like surrendering. It feels like letting go. It feels like letting the other person win. And that doesn't feel really good. But we have, as the model, what he says in this next line, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And the way I want to talk about how we can look out for other people uh, is an example that I came across. You know that Winning at Home, we're a marriage and family organization. And so I came across this thing, and it's about marriage, but I, I don't want you to check out if you're thinking only in those terms, because this applies to relationships in general. It's not just about a husband and a wife. This is about our relationships with our neighbors and our coworkers and our friends and our brothers and sisters, our family, all that stuff. So even though it's about marriage, I want you to be thinking about it from a bigger perspective because we're going to go there uh, at the end anyway. So in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, a divorce began to be more and more common in the United States. And so while that was happening, there were a bunch of people who study human nature. They study why we do what we do. They study what kind of impact things have on us. And they started writing a bunch of papers and books and studies and all this stuff about what kind of impact divorce was having on people. And so you can find these resources. You can see emotionally what kind of impact it has on couples that go through a divorce. You can see financially. You can see what kind of impact it has on kids that their parents went through a divorce. You can find all that stuff. But there was one guy in the midst of it, a psychologist, his name was John Gottman, and he didn't want to figure out what happened after divorce. He wanted to figure out what led up to divorce. And so he got together with a little team of researchers, and they said, okay, well, if we're going to figure out what leads to divorce, we can't study divorced people. We have to study engaged couples or people who just got married. So they did that. They sat down and they had conversations with a whole bunch of engaged and newly married couples. 
and they ask them the normal stuff that you hear about if you're in a relationship. You know, how'd you meet? How'd you propose? What's some conflict you've overcome recently? What's something you're looking forward to? The normal couple type of stuff. But because they were scientists and researchers, they didn't just ask those questions. They hooked them up, and this is kind of weird. So if you're not into science, like just hang with me for just a second, because I think it's weird too, so it's okay if you think it's weird. Um, they hooked them up to a bunch of monitors and sensors because they wanted to measure their heart rate, their blood flow, and how much sweat their body was producing while they sat and had this conversation about how they met, how they got engaged, all that kind of stuff. So they got done with that, and they're like, okay, we, we can't really know how these relationships are going to play out yet. So they let six years pass, and they went back and they interviewed all those couples. And six years later, just like you know, we see in the relationships we know of, Six years into marriage, some of the couples we know, they were doing really great. They're the relationship that we're aiming for. They really love and support each other and sacrifice for each other, and they're, they're in a really healthy relationship. And they found that a lot of these couples were healthy. They called them the masters. They're not that creative. They're scientists, so we give them a little bit of leeway. So they called them the masters. And then over here, they found some couples that they were still married, but they were, you know, it's kind of that like sitcom cliche, like they don't really like to be in the same room with each other. They don't enjoy being around each other. It's not a healthy relationship dynamic. And they found some of the couples had been divorced six years in. And so in keeping with their not real creative naming, you got the masters over here and you got the disasters over here, okay? Yeah, it's not so great, but it helps keep them straight, it helps us remember. So then they went back and they looked at all those results from the test before. And they found that the couples that six years later were healthy and the couples that six years later were unhealthy or divorced, they had some things in common. And they found that these disasters over here, six years ago, even though on the outside they all looked the same, they all looked like they were just a regular couple having a conversation. They found out that internally, their heart rate was higher, their blood flow in their bodies was, uh, was elevated, more extreme, more blood pumping through faster. They were producing more sweat. They realized that these disasters, just sitting next to their partner, they were in fight or flight mode. And you remember that concept from elementary or middle school, whatever. You see a bear in the woods and you freeze for a second and then you got to decide, am I going to fight this thing or am I going to take off? Just being next to their spouse internally put them into that spot because they knew their history of their relationship. And they knew that at any moment they needed to be ready because they might be attacked and they might need to attack. Not physically, but verbally, emotionally, mentally. They knew that that's how things went. Now, like I said, this isn't just about marriage because we can all picture, I'm guessing, maybe some of you already had that person's face popping up in the back of your mind. We've all got someone that we're just oil and water. When we get together, it's just, I don't know why, but there is just conflict, and it's just I'm on edge the whole time I'm around them. Well, that's what they found. Some of these couples, that was their spouse. That was their fiance. That just set them on edge the whole time. And they're like, okay, that's interesting, but we can't just tell people, you know, don't be in fight or flight mode and you're good to go. Go do it. You know, that, that's not going to help anybody. So they wanted to figure out, okay, what leads to that feeling? And so they set up this bed and breakfast and they let people know they were studying them. They invited them to come and stay as couples, and they were just going to watch how they interacted with each other to see if they could figure out what led up to this tension, this fight-or-flight feeling internally. And what they found is that all couples, whether they were the masters or the disasters, all couples did something that they called made bids for each other's attention. And an example they gave, this bed and breakfast was kind of out in the... Um, kind of out in the woods a little bit, and one of the husbands who was there 
was a really avid bird watcher. All right, I'm guessing we don't have a lot of bird watchers in the crowd, but this guy was a bird watcher. And he looked out the window and he found a bird that he normally couldn't find at home. And he said to his wife, oh, there's that bird I've been trying to find forever. All right, that's a bid for attention. And we don't do it about birds. I'm guessing not many of us in here do that. But we all do it about our hobbies, about something we just read online, about some video that we watched, about some funny thing that we saw. We all share our lives with the people around us. And they found that there were three different responses that couples came back to each other with when they made a bid for their attention. One was a positive response. This didn't mean necessarily it had to be a long conversation, but it was something like, oh, that's cool. I'm glad you saw that bird. Thanks for pointing that out. Good. That's a positive interaction. Then there was kind of the neutral. You could even say the same words like the guy that was cleaning the bathroom. You could do the right thing, but if you're doing it the wrong way, it doesn't come across positive, right? So you go, oh, cool. I'm glad you found that. That's neutral at best. Then the negative response. Some of these couples just totally ignored each other. Didn't even say anything in response at all. Uh, some came back with something, hey, don't bother me about that. You know I don't care about that. Some said even harsher things. And so they categorized, they went back and said, okay, we, we see a pattern. This couple here that's an unhealthy relationship, they keep doing that. And they found that the disasters, only about 33% of the time, came back with a positive response when their partner tried to get their attention. Now, we don't have to work hard at all to imagine that if we tried to share something we were excited about or interested in or cared about with somebody, and two out of three times they ignored us or said something negative, we're going to stop sharing our life with that person because it's obviously not a safe place to do it. We're just going to kind of shut down. We're going we're gonna to stop sharing our lives. They found that the masters, uh, almost 90% of the time, 87%, they came back and had a positive response for their partner when they made a bid for their attention. Now, I want to tell you what this looks like played out on a really practical level. Because my wife and I, we've been married for a little over three years. And we thankfully came across this really early in our relationship. And we decided we were going to try to practice it. So what this looks like is we'll be at home and I'll usually be on my laptop hanging out some night, whatever I'm looking. I do, I do pretty good about not bringing work home. So usually I'm like looking at eBay or reading something I'm interested in. I'm not like in the middle of something important. And my wife will be over on her phone and she She's really big into fashion and crafting and artistic type of stuff like that. And you see how I'm dressed. Like, I'm not, you know? It's kind of obvious. So she's on Etsy or she's on Pinterest, whatever, and I'm over here doing my thing. And she'll say, hey, Alan, come over here and take a look at this. And she, she points her phone at me and she shows me a picture of a shirt, but she doesn't call it a shirt. I want, I want you guys to know something real quick. Uh, guys, none of those up there is called a shirt. I don't know if you knew that, but there's all different kinds of stuff. You got a cardigan, a button-up, uh, something else, a couple other things. I don't know. So she shows me a picture of some of these shirts, but she calls it something fancy. And I'm, like I said, I'm not in the middle of something important, but I'm in the middle of something I care about more than I care about shirts. Now, I, I have the opportunity to say, hey, you know, that's cool, but I'm not really into that. I, I'm not going to do that. Or I have a chance to shut my laptop, sit it down, walk over there, and take a look. Because when I see what Gottman and his team found, I realize that she is not saying, hey, Alan, do you care about this shirt? She's saying, hey, Alan, do you care about me? And I have the opportunity to stop what I'm doing, that's not important. That's certainly not more important than her feeling valued. I can walk over there and take a look at a shirt. Like I said, it doesn't have to be a long conversation. 
I don't know how you could have that long of a conversation about a shirt. Anyway, I mean, usually the conversation, I'm like, what? That thing cost that much? You know, but we, that, that's what it looks like in our home. But I don't want you to think that it's just I'm doing stuff and Annalise is distracting me with stuff that she's into because uh, my, my poor wife, I am a huge NBA basketball fan. And so it's the playoffs right now. You probably didn't know that. So it's like two months of Christmas for me. Like I watch basketball all the time. And she hears when someone scores 40 points that I didn't think was going to score 40 points. She hears when guys get traded, when they get big contracts. She hears all kinds of stuff that she's like, why would I ever care about this, right? She knows. I, I want to let you know how deep this goes. She knows who this guy is, all right? Now, some of you big basketball fans might be like, yeah, I, I know who he is, but I don't know how to say his name because this is his name, all right? I want you to picture, I want you to get in your head what those two words sound like out loud, all right? I know neither looks like a word, but they are, okay? This guy's name is Giannis Attentacumpo, all right? Annalise knows that. She makes fun of NBA announcers because they don't say the name as good as she can say it. <laughs> Guys, I, I'm not joking. I pause the game. I'm like, who is this? She's like, Giannis Attentacupo. It's hilarious. She doesn't care about this guy. She cares about me, though. And I'll tell you what. When I pause that game and she yells that out, it makes me feel good. I don't even understand why. It sounds stupid to stand up here. And I feel dumb saying it right now but it makes me feel good. I'm like, she really cares about me because I know she doesn't care about that guy. And what's going to happen today? Uh, before you get home, I'm going to guess for most of you, you're going to have the opportunity to respond to a bid for attention, whether it's from your husband or wife, or one of your kids, or your parent, brother, sister, whatever, you're going to have the opportunity to stop what you're doing and say, I don't really care about Giannis, but I really care about you, and let me show you. I don't really care about shirts, but I really care about you, and let me show you. You're, like I said, probably before you get home today, definitely by the end of today, and you're going to have a chance to practice it tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Uh, what, they, what these researchers described, the difference between the masters and the disasters, they said that the masters were constantly, and they really used this word, the same word Paul was talking about in Philippians 2. They said the masters are constantly scanning their environment for things that they can engage with their partner on and praise their partner for. They said disasters, on the other hand, they're constantly scanning their environment to find flaws, mistakes, dishes that you said you were going to do that you didn't do so that they can win those arguments, those back and forths. So the question isn't, are we scanning? Are we on the lookout? Are we constantly watching to see what's going on in our world? The question is simply, are we scanning for our own interest, for our own benefit, for our own stuff? Or are we doing it for a bigger purpose? Because what we know, and it, this is coming up on the screen, this is not some deep insight, okay? You all knew this when you walked in today. Inward focus destroys relationships. When we only are dialed in on us, when we're only worried about what we're going to get out of something, out of a relationship, out of an interaction, out of doing this little small talk with this person we saw at work yesterday and we're going to see him tomorrow and they're asking us the same thing. How was your night? I, I, that's where I struggle the most. I'm good at it with Annalise, but when I see the same people every day, I say, how was your night last night? I'm like, you don't care. You, I struggle, and I start to focus inward. But what happens is that does damage, and ultimately, eventually, 
destroys relationships. But outward focus, others focus, makes them flourish. And Jesus, when he uh, was at the Last Supper with his disciples, it was one of the last opportunities he really had to do some teaching with them. He told them at this last opportunity to really have a sit-down teaching. He said, people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's the reason that we stay others-focused. Not so people look and say, oh, wow, you guys have a great marriage. You must be amazing people. Or, wow, when you walk in the room, it just I just feel energized because I know you're going to bring joy. It's because people see Jesus reflected in the way that we're loving other people. That's what we want our lives to be all about. That's why that phrase, it's not about you, it's not about me, it seems kind of harsh at first because it's a little bit in your face. But the reality is that it's not what our lives are about. That's why we're gathered here this morning because we know we need at least weekly reminders. I need hourly reminders often to surrender. To really, yeah, to really give my life over to the lordship of Jesus and to be known as his disciple by the way that I love people. And the way people see this love is in these really small, tiny, seemingly insignificant interactions. When they try to share a little bit of their lives with us, how do we respond? Do we blow them off? Do we ignore them? Do we say something that shuts them down because we don't care and we don't want to talk about it? Or do we say, yeah, I'm not really into that, but I, I do really care about you, so let's talk about it for a minute. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. And like I said, I'm, I'm guessing that at some point this morning there was a person's face that kind of popped up in the back of your mind or a, a circumstance, a situation, a place, when you're really tired or when you're at work or when whatever, there's an area where you know you can improve on being others-focused, being outward-focused. Just spend some time, you and God. Surrender that. Ask for his strength. God, this morning we thank you for the reminder from your word. We thank you for the way, God, that your truth, uh, it has a way of both challenging us and encouraging us. And God, we pray that we'll walk out of here this morning feeling both, feeling challenged in the areas, God, that we fall short of this, where we stay inward focused, where we don't let our love for others um, focus in on them, but we just stay in our own little world. God, we pray too for encouragement as we seek to do this. God, we know that we'll be empowered by your Holy Spirit. We're not in this on our own. We, we can't will ourselves to do this. God, this is something that we need to work with you and let you work in us to accomplish. We pray that we'll do that so that people see you reflected in our lives. That's what we want them to be all about. God, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you go today, go loving people like Jesus, even when it seems like those tiny, insignificant moments, because they make a huge difference. You're dismissed.